So keeping that in mind, that during the crisis, you know, what happened was that, you know, as you know, with any accounting standard, all accounting standards uh, are meant to relay or communicate the economic reality as it happens. So when, when people do not like the economic reality, so they start blaming the accounting standards. And that's exactly what happened during the crisis with IS-39 as well. So when the financial markets saw a lot of turbulence, uh, the effect was that many people start criticizing the very fundamental basis of accounting, that is fair value basis of accounting. And people said that since the financial instruments are accounted for using fair values, so during the crisis when the fair values were going down, so the banks and the financial institutions and many entities had to take a lot of write downs of assets and those write downs pushed those entities to, to sell those assets in distressed conditions which further contributed to the crisis. So had the accounting not been on the fair value basis, perhaps the effect of the crisis would have been reduced. Now this is the theory but uh, whether or not this theory is correct or incorrect is a debate itself, so, which, per, which, which is not really the topic of discussion today. But what I uh, meant to say is that a lot of criticism was made on the fair value accounting uh, which was prescribed by IES 39. The second major aspect of the criticism was directed towards the impairment approach, the way the impairment of assets is accounted for under IS-39. And it was said uh, by many international forums and regulators and bank supervisors that the impairment model results in delayed recognition of credit losses. You know, under IS-39, the impairment losses are recognized when there is an objective evidence of impairment, when a default occurs or an event of default occurs. Not before that, but at the same time, it is inherent in any, any credit or loan that is granted that there is always an inherent risk of credit loss. So why wait till the time the actual default occurs? So that, re, that was the argument put forward by many of the regulators and accountants, that perhaps the impairment trigger event results in delayed recognition of losses and therefore, when the crisis occurred, uh, many of the banks had to take immediate provisions on, on account of credit losses. Had they been foreseeing that before that, and perhaps the effect of the crisis would be less as compared to what we saw. But again, this kind of uh, argument uh, is contradictory to the very fundamental basis of the accounting which says that uh, losses should be recognized in the period in which the loss occurs. So we'll debate on that as well in the later slides, but that was the criticism that was made. And thirdly and most importantly, it was also criticized that the standard is too complex to apply and interpret. The standard requires mixed valuation models, meaning certain assets are carried at fair value, certain assets are carried at amortized cost. Certain assets, uh, in case of certain assets, gain or loss on fair valuation goes to the P&L account, whereas in certain cases, the gain or loss goes to the equity. And the interplay between those classifications, again, on top of it, makes the accounting very, very complex for a, for a normal reader to understand and apply. And also, it gives an opportunity to the preparers of the financial st uh, statements to play around those classifications so that they can achieve their objectives in terms of the profitability. Uh, so these kind of criticism resulted in ISB uh, reviewing the IS-39. And the review is so much intense and the and the, and the criticism was so much intense that uh, it resulted in a major overhaul of the standard, the total overhaul of IS-39. And that is basically we'll discuss today what kind of overhaul has been undertaken till now 
and what is to come in next year and so. Now, I just wanted to point out here that it is not that, uh, you know, that only the crisis exposed the weaknesses in the accounting standards. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to uh, a discussion paper which was released by ISB and US Financial Accounting Standard Board, FASB, in March 2008, which is uh, at the very start of the crisis, which, which, is on the reducing, which is on reducing complexities in reporting financial instruments. So the, reali the realization was always there that the accounting standard on financial instruments is perhaps too complex. And therefore, uh, this was the topic of discussion even before the crisis. But what happened after the crisis is that, you know, it triggered the speed of that process and the ISB had to embark on a very uh, speedy task to, uh, to replace the financial instruments accounting. Now, the approach taken by ISB for a revision of IS39 is into phases. There are three phases which ISB prescribed uh, as, 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 as its approach to replace the IS39. The first phase deals with the classification and measurement of financial instruments. So in the first phase, it was decided to only review those aspects of IS39 which deals with the classification and measurement of financial assets only. And what we see as a product of this phase is IFRS 9, which is standard issued in November 2009, which only deals with the classification and measurement of financial instruments. It does not deal with other requirements of financial instruments like uh, impairment uh, methodology or uh, the hedge accounting or derecognition. So the only the aspects dealing with the classification and measurement of financial instruments are dealt with under IS 39, uh, under IFRS 9. The standard is issued in November 2009. It is uh, available for early adoption, but the mandatory effective date as prescribed by ISB is January 2013. So there's a lot of time uh, for the users to evaluate its potential impact before they can apply the standard. And I'll discuss uh, also the implications of the adoption and how it will result in a change accounting model. The second phase, which is on the impairment method methodology for financial assets. In this phase, till date, ISB released an exposure draft, firstly in November 2009, and then uh, in January 2011, this exposure draft is further revised by adding a supplement. The supplement is actually a, a, a result of the joint discussions with ISB had with US FASB on a common impairment approach for financial assets. So the, both the boards discussed that uh, ISB approach and the US GAAP approach for credit loss impairment should more or less be the same and therefore uh, they made changes to the exposure draft which was earlier released in November 2009. Those changes have been incorporated in the exposure draft very recently in January 2011 so we'll also see what changes, uh, what those changes are uh, in terms of the credit loss imp requirements. And then in the third phase, which deals with the hedge accounting, the ISB is very recently, uh, in January this year, uh, has released, uh, so, sorry, in December 2010, has published an exposure draft on the hedge accounting. This is still an exposure draft stage, and I think the comment period on this exposure draft has recently expired. So there are three phases for which will result in the replacement of IS39, classification and measurement, IFRS 9 already issued, impairment for which exposure draft is issued, and hedge accounting for which exposure draft is issued. Now as each phase will, will get complete, uh, the IS39 requirements dealing with that phase will be deleted and new chapters would be added to IFRS 9. So what will happen when all these phases are complete, which is expectedly by the end of this year, uh, we'll have a completely new standard, IFRS 9, which will result in 
total replacement.